Watch this. For the first time in history, we mandated the economy shut down by law. Now, we don't yet know the benefits of that, but we do know the cost. It's about $2 trillion. And one must ask, what is the cost of not acting? Well, after that 60-second speech on the House floor, Congressman Russ Fulcher voiced his vote in favor of the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. Idaho's other congressman, Mike Simpson, also shouted out his eye this morning, passing the $2.2 trillion CARES bill. It was signed into law by the president shortly after. It may be the only thing moving faster than the virus itself and is now the largest economic stimulus package ever put into play by the U.S. Congress. Just before he went back into the House chamber, we spoke with Representative Fulcher from his D.C. office about why he thought this was the best way to keep COVID-19 from continuing its economic toll on our country. This is unprecedented in the sense that the government caused a lot of this by forcing people to shut down now, for the right reasons. But nevertheless, that's what happened. And in my mind, they assumed responsibility for helping get that started again. And so uh, here we go. And uh, I think this is this is the right thing to do. But uh, it definitely goes against my grain to to sign on to that much debt. How do you feel then about voting for one, the largest stimulus package. I mean, $2.2 trillion, that's, that's not chump change. That's, that's going to go on for a while. It's, it's, gut, it's gut-wrenching. The good news is we're going to help some people in the short term, Brian. The bad news is we're sending the bill to your grandkids. And, and there, therein lies the gut-wrenching part of this. On the other side of that, I mean, there are some people who say $1,200, a one-time stimulus check. Is that going to be enough? Because we don't know how long this is going to last. Of course not, no. But it's it's not just that. It's the combination of things. It's the assistance to the small businesses to encourage the employment, the extension of unemployment benefits. It's the, the low-cost loans so the companies can stay in business. The, uh, you know, the, the, the cash component is probably the most controversial for the reasons you just said. It's the other components of this that try to keep the economic engine rolling or to get it rolling again. And so, and there's, there's a lot of things not to like in this bill. Uh, and believe me, I'm going to get an earful from my constituency when it happens, and I should. Okay, that was my next question. What are you hearing from Idahoans about this? Uh, it's about 50-50, and it won't surprise you. The uh, urban side, the urban dem- demographic is help. Uh, uh, get us as much help as you can, as quickly as you can. The more rural component is, you guys are crazy. Why are you taking on this debt? And guess what? They're both right. What changed your mind between your last no vote on a similar stimulus package and this one? Oh, uh, well, there's really no comparison. The, the, the last one wasn't even known yet. Uh, that's created a lot of angst with a lot of people. The second thing is just what I said. It's having to respond to the fact that we took an unprecedented position of the government shutting down by law the, the economy. And the third factor and the third difference was it coming to grips with what is the cost of not doing the stimulus? What is the cost of not taking action? The data indicates to me that would be greater than taking this action that we're taking today. So it's a yes, but a reluctant yes on your part. Uh, yeah, no question. That's true. $2.2 trillion. That's a lot of zeros. Fulcher told me there were several things he did not like about the bill, as you heard him say, things that he got added along the way that had nothing to do with the coronavirus. But he said that's politics. And he only hopes that this bill will do what it's supposed to do and bring back some financial stability for Americans. It's going to get a lot harder. And just using Blaine County as an example for the rest of the state, um, it's going to get a lot harder everywhere else. Dr. Brock Bemis is one of the nearly 100 confirmed coronavirus cases in Blaine County. He's also one of the two doctors at St. Luke's Wood River Medical Center who contracted the virus. At one point, four of the seven ER doctors were out of commission there because of COVID-19. Being sick or just being exposed to it put them in quarantine. So you can understand how hard Blaine County was hit with this and how quickly it got out of hand. Dr. Bemis has recovered and he's set to go back to work tomorrow for just a short shift. But what will that look like? What can we learn medically from Idaho's epicenter? 
do you know what you're getting back into? Uh, well, you know, I think that, I mean, it sounds like it's pretty challenging from talking with my partners as far as how many people are needing to be admitted um, and how many people are really sick. But overall, our volumes are down. I think a lot of people look to uh, St. Luke's and Blaine County because you're the hot spot of Idaho. You're a rural spot in Idaho. And so capacity and equipment and all it takes to fight this virus, people are looking to see how you guys are doing this. And, and what's that going to be like? From a system perspective, I think us being kind of the a canary in the coal mine has been good for the system so that they could learn lessons from what we've gone through and kind of improve their response. Are, are you worried about not having enough resources or even not enough space or, or, or any of that? Right now, our hospital actually had to close down our inpatient unit because we had so many s staff members that were exposed. So we don't we don't have inpatient beds here. Um, but hopefully, as we all kind of get back to being healthy and get past our 14 day quarantine, um, we'll be able to reopen that. You're a tight knit group. You mentioned uh, there's just seven of you in the ER uh, facility there, and. You guys talk regularly. So what's kind of the mood then when it comes to you and your, your group? Initially, uh, we were pretty panicked, especially since several of us were out of commission. But, um, you know, speaking with my partners that are really working hard right now, it seems more upbeat than it was a week ago. Um, and now a couple of the folks who were on quarantine are off. Um, I'm, you know, I'm coming back tomorrow. So we should have a full complement of healthy docs ready to kind of kick some butt here. The description that we're being told is to flatten this curve so that we don't go past our, our medical capacity. Is that a real concern? Yeah. The hard part is, is that we're always going to be a week or two or three behind that curve because people aren't getting symptoms until that far into their disease course. So what we do right now isn't going to be realized as far as benefit for a couple weeks. And I think the, the main key is that a lot of people are sick and they don't even know it. So they're getting people sick um, inadvertently, obviously, but um, that's the biggest threat here. People feeling like, oh, I'm fine. I can go hang out with others. But then you give that to them, they give it to two and a half more people. And, it, and so it keeps going on, you know? So is there though, a light at the end of the tunnel for you and, and Blaine County right now? It looks like this is going to be a lot longer than a couple or three weeks down the road. Um, and I think, you know, it's a challenge to balance the economic concerns with the health, the public health concerns, because if everybody gets sick and we do have the numbers of, of deaths that we're talking about, that's going to be a lot worse for the economy in the long run. And not just from an economic perspective, but from taking care of each other perspective. You know, we got to do what we can to make sure we're all safe. And so I think it's just super crucial for everyone to to stay home. Latest numbers out of Blaine County show 98 confirmed cases of the coronavirus. We're up to 231 across the state with four deaths attributed to the virus. I asked Dr. Bemis if he's now immune to COVID-19, something you may have wondered or many of you have. If you can get it, recover, can you get it again? Well, he told me he isn't 100% sure, but he knows his body had to learn how to fight it and beat it in order to survive. Well, surviving is obviously the objective in all of this, physically, economically, socially. Dr. Bemis admits it's going to get darker before we see more light, but there is some good news out there when it comes to our fight against COVID-19. It has to do with testing. We've had a lot of questions on this one, especially. Why does it take so long to get test results back? The state lab tells us they can have results in 24 to 36 hours, but that channel is kept open for hospitalized patients. So that leaves testing to the commercial labs like LabCorp and Quest Diagnostics. And they're telling people it will take four to eight days to see results. Why? Well, we asked that of Dr. Tommy Alquist. His company owns Salter Medical Group in Nampa and one of the places testing for COVID-19 right now. We had other questions about the process and he tells us it all begins with questions. Do you have a fever? Do you have a cough? Uh, do you have any respiratory symptoms? Have you been exposed or do you meet the other criteria I just said? If the answer is yes, then they will swab you. And it's a nasal pharyngeal swab. So it goes back into your nose. It's, you know, a, a swab. It's a swab about this long and it goes into viral culture medium labeled with your name 
and get sent out immediately to the lab. Our lab we use is in California through Quest. So there's the transit time down there to Quest. And then once it gets to Quest, it gets in line. And that's your, you, you hit the nail on the head already. That's, that's the problem now is now it's in line with hundreds of thousands of these tests now coming in from all over the country. And then when your test is processed, it's reported back out. We get a hold of you immediately. Um, so that, that's the process. If there was no line, how long would a test result take? Minutes. I mean, it, it, minutes. I mean, the sample goes in the vial, it's pulled out, it goes through the PCR testing and pops out the other end, yes or no, and, and the answer comes out. So, so the testing itself is actually very quick. It, it's just this process and now the backlog. Wow. I'm just trying to get an, a grasp on this. Something that takes minutes is taking four to eight days. My frustration level has been up here this entire time because you knew this was coming, right? We knew it was coming. And so when we knew it was coming, why weren't we up? The, the one thing we could have done early on is tested and pre prepared to test. And, and I'm not pointing fingers because I think it was the private sector. I think it was the state and the federal government. Everyone fell flat footed. And, and, and here it comes. And then, and then you could predict all this, right? OK, oh, no, where are we going to test? OK, we have it available. OK, now we don't have enough equipment, supply chain. Well, now we have supplies. Well, now we have too many tests. So it's just this evolution, literally in 12 hour cycles, that, that there, I am, I'm positive, I'm confident talking to Quest, they're, they're now increasing the number of machines they have to run these, they're increasing processes. So we will see this get better. One thing that I know is we're, we're in America and, and the, the entrepreneurial, you know, innovative spirit of, of Idaho and America is real. People are scrambling. I know they are right now to figure this out, how to fix this problem. So we will get to a point where everyone can get tested and you're going to have machines. Your turnaround times are going to be quicker. That will absolutely happen. It just takes a little bit of time, as you can imagine, to get them going. PCR testing is that polymerase chain reaction test, which is basically replicating DNA and looking for any fingerprint of the virus. And that's how we find out if you're positive or negative. I reached out to Quest, by the way, Quest Labs, Quest Diagnostics today to ask them about the possibility of getting more machines and more staff to do the testing, speed the process up. Haven't heard back as of yet, but just in the two weeks they have been testing for coronavirus, they have increased their capacity to process 25,000 tests a day in just three labs across the country. They are hoping, though, to increase to a dozen labs across the country soon. Either way, we are still behind the curve in our attempt to flatten that curve. Here comes Santa Claus. In March? Why, some airwaves are rewinding three months to give us round-the-clock Christmas music this weekend. Have you gotten outside today? If not, sit back and relax as we bring this pretty perfect day right to your TV screen. Speaking of screens, have your phone in your hands by chance? Well, type in this number, 208-321-5614, and you can text us your questions and your comments. Be sure to include your name and make it a good one. We're going to read some of your comments at the end of the show. Covering coronavirus with facts over fear.
Hey, nice afternoon though. It was kind of breezy. We had some wind gusts that were up to about 25 miles an hour. This is going to change a little bit for this weekend though. And let me show you some of the high temperatures that we've had so far this afternoon. This is like the fourth straight day. We haven't hit 50 degrees. We've been forecasting 50, 51, just clouds coming into the afternoon. We end up about 49. Ontario at 55 and they have a chance of hitting 60 degrees for tomorrow. So here are your winds. At the President's North at 8, they're starting to die down a little bit. They've been up to 15, 20 miles an hour since about 3 o'clock. Now we're seeing it die down for your evening walk if that's what you would like to do. So that's looking better. But earlier today, if you were out, you probably noticed we had some gusts out there. Boise had a wind gust of 25 miles an hour. Caldwell 21, Nampa 21, Ontario 18, Mountain Home with 30. And you see 29 mile an hour wind gust in Twin and 20 mile an hour wind gust in Haley. So still wind gusts around the area. And for tomorrow, this is the predicted wind gust. Not as much. Now what I have in the forecast is winds that'll be southeast about 5 to 15 miles per hour. And you can see it kind of makes that switch from the morning to about noon to the southeast. That's what's going to drive our temperatures at least into the mid 50s, then almost to the south. That's why we're going to be looking at some warmer temperatures and you can see those winds that will be somewhere between 5 to 15 miles an hour. Latest radar shows a few showers up here into the higher elevations. There's not a lot of moisture at this point, so it's likely just the higher elevations. But going out here to the west, showers around Seattle, Vancouver, more of a storm up here to the north, which will drop down along the coastline. That's going to give us some moisture, especially going into Sunday as well as Monday. So Twin Falls for tomorrow will be right around 50. Shoshone will be up to 52 degrees. In your central mountains, you see temperature 44 for Sun Valley. And then to the western mountains, McCall at 40. Down here in the valley, looking at Caldwell and Nampa and other locations, mainly the mid to upper 50s to 56 degrees for Boise. Seven day forecast we talked about tomorrow. Sunday has a chance of showers. Same thing for early Monday. Tuesday could be an isolated shower. After that, with those southeasterly winds, that's where these temperatures start to come up, as you can see. You get to 59 Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Could be even be a 60 degree reading somewhere in there. Finally, we'll get up above that 50 degree mark.
Have you noticed your neighbors putting up Christmas lights recently? Yeah, I said Christmas lights and yes, it is nearly April and no, you're not seeing things. It's becoming a worldwide trend right now. People pulling out boxes of the colorful lights from their garages or attics and all in an effort to bring some joy during this time of uncertainty. So 101.5 Cool FM, well, they're stepping in to turn this time of uncertainty into a time of unity through music. 101.5 Cool FM. It was uh, my afternoon guy, Brian Gregory's idea. He said, hey, I do a top five at five every weekday afternoon. I want to do my top five Christmas songs. And I said, okay, why? And he goes, yeah, just to lighten the mood around the community. And I said, you know, it's a great idea. Let's let's do 24 hours. Coming up this afternoon at 5 o'clock, it's a very special Be Cool Top 5 at 5. We play Christmas music during uh, Christmas time, and this is the first time we're venturing out, as they say. I think part of it is that everybody knows these Christmas songs and... Uh, you know, the anticipation of getting Santa to come to your house just makes you feel good and makes uh, makes us all little kids again, really. Try to make people smile a little and uh, know that there's still hope out there. It, it, it may not seem like it, but there really is. So we're all in this together, and uh, if we just do what the authorities tell us to do, uh, we can get through this, and it's all going to be okay, and there is still a lot of hope and good things going on out in the community. Well, as of about 15 minutes ago, Cool FM 101.5 is going to crank out 24 hours of Christmas music. You heard DJ KJ Mack there saying right now this is just a one time thing, but who knows, depending on the feedback they get, they won't rule out doing it again in the future. Well, before we head to the break, we're bringing back a segment to the 208 we like to call Where Is This? So, where's this? We're going to tell you coming up after the break. All right, before the break, we we're supposed to show you this video to get you to guess where this is. But if you didn't see the video at some point, you saw it. But this is the Friendship Bridge near Boise State, built in 1980. 
The bridge sits over the Boise River, connects the university to Julia Davis Park, as you may know. It's taken last fall, these pictures, by the way. You can see the leaves changing colors on the trees there, people chatting, walking along on what really looks like a pretty nice fall day, doesn't it? Yeah, so that's the Friendship Bridge. But you can see people out socializing, getting together. That was then when social distancing was a term no one really heard of, let alone say it out loud several times a day. Back when we could go outside and enjoy the company of others. Again, that was then, but this is now your moment of Zen. Well, it's been a long and tumultuous week here, especially when it comes to coronavirus. Appreciate you sending in your comments and questions during the 208. Let's get to some of them right now. This one sent in from Cynthia. Dropped my son off at work. Shocked to see how many people were packed at the Walmart in Candy County, not to mention the park down the road from my house. People are not listening to the stay at home order or the social distancing of six feet apart in Canyon County. And that seems to be the problem. We do need to start taking this more seriously. It's OK to go outside in your neighborhood. Just stay at least six feet away from each other. I understand we got to go to the store, but take this seriously or else we're not going to be able to get a handle on it. And uh, again, that's the order from the governor. We are to stay at home order across the state. Will the state extend the required uh, due date for the driver's licenses and ID cards? Yes, they have already been extended. That's a federal thing, by the way. Star card has already been extended. That was October 1st has been pushed back. Hi, Brian, can you tell us if we'll be expected to pay income tax on the stimulus money next year? No, you will not be paying income tax on the stimulus check, which could be anywhere from uh, well, $1,200 for a person. Uh, this one always, let me get back to this one. Uh, 
going a little too fast on some of these. We have a lot of people sending questions about that. And if have to do with Social Security, if you're on Social Security, will you get an income tax or a stimulus check? It's based on your tax returns that you sent in uh, either last year or this year. Last question or one of these questions. Are public restrooms safe to use at parks and trails now or anytime? Because I think that's a question for any time sometimes, don't you think? I will say this, it has been a crazy week. It has been a hectic week when it comes to the coronavirus. It doesn't seem like there's any end in sight. It may seem like it's endless. It's not, there will be an end. It's just relentless right now. So take some, take, take some time for yourself this weekend. Get outside in your backyard and enjoy it. We'll see you on Monday.